Real Enigmas and Theories is back with another video. And I think Tian Chen has figured out a solution for the food shortage. Only two tablespoons of salt per jar. We got a limited supply. We got to make it last. Well, how long is it going to last like this? We do things right. It should keep to a year. Things Donna, there's barely a month's worth of food here. <sighs> Come on, let's get back to business. She's just going to take a little bit of this vegan air and put it in the jars to stretch out the food a bit. Nobody will even notice the difference. No, seriously. What is a horror show without blood? What is it about blood that makes it such a necessity in the horror genre? It's like a secret sauce. The splatters on the wall, on the floor, a person drenched in blood indicates that someone has either died or is in danger of succumbing to the loss of this vital liquid that is needed for the life of every being and every horror show. Blood also symbolizes family, ancestry, and lineage. And the way that the showrunners have used blood and from has been successful at not only scaring the audience, but giving some clues to the characters on the show and the viewers. Now, if you've been watching my channel, you know that I've been covering things like the grandparents, the presence of Native American sorcery, the clues about America's past, the lore inside of the show like the Kramanaku and the Gulagog, and much more. But for this part of the video, we're going to focus on the blood and how the show uses it to give us a strong message about what's going on and from, and why our residents have been brought to this place. So without further ado, let's uncover the mystery that is from. In every vision that Jade had prior to entering the tunnels, he saw blood. In the root cellar, blood. At the tree, blood. Even when he saw the ventriloquist dummy, blood. Also when he saw Chris with the book, blood. But we're not gonna get into that stuff yet. Let's talk about episode one where we first see Ellis and Fatima. No, not this time, when we first see them. Yeah, that's right. When Boyd was looking at them through the binoculars when they were outside playing volleyball with Matthias. This is also the first time we get a look at the front of Colony House. In this scene, we can see Ellis delivering the last point-scoring volley against Matthias and the female that he was playing with before the sun went down. Keep that thought. We also get a glimpse at the barber pole in the front of Colony House. Now, who was traveling with a barber pole in their car and ended up in this place? Maybe Christy should have went up to Colony House to get her hair cut instead of letting Marielle chop it up. I did see somebody up there cutting hair. Now, the barber profession was drastically different than it is today. Barbers used to do far more than just cutting hair. At one point in history, clergy was responsible for performing all surgery, but edicts were issued preventing them from doing so. And barbers started performing a variety of procedures, tooth extraction, removing limbs of people with gangrene, and even bloodletting. Just like what we saw with Ellis in episode 206, barbers would also perform blood transfusion, which we also saw in that episode. They also nodded back to the blood brother ritual with Martin, with Boyd and Smiles Davis. Now the barber pole is also a symbolic reference to blood. The pole itself symbolizes an instrument that was gripped during bloodletting to encourage blood flow. The red stripe also represents the arterial blood, which is bright red and rich with oxygen. The blue represents the venous blood, which is dark due to the lack of oxygen. Now, the crazy part about the scene with Ellis and Matthias is that Ellis scores the last point before sundown, and his life was saved using the bloodletting and transfusion techniques while Matthias was killed in a very similar way. No doubt Reggie hit a major artery when he caught Matthias slipping. There's a lot of meaning in the name Matthias, 
However, my attention is still on the arteries, veins, and bloodletting. Now, there must be a reason why the slow walkers in the ghoulish kids' veins look alike. The blue and red stands out like a sore thumb, and the similarities are most likely not a coincidence. Do the slow walkers start out as the ghoulish kids? If that's the case, how do we explain the differences in the age appearance of the slow walker? Before Jasmine was led into Colony House, she says that she didn't ask to be this way. I wonder if she had shared with him how they got that way in order to gain his trust and was just reminding him that it wasn't her choice to be that way. Also, are the slow walkers drained of their fluids or was Smiles Davis dried out as a result of his encounter with Boyd and his death? Boyd goes from a blood brother ritual to a blood transfusion with Ellis. Could the slow walkers have been created by the exact opposite procedure? Also, for more than 60 years from 1892, Ellis Island was the immigration stop for over 12 million immigrants, and for some, it was called the Island of Hope. But for many, it was more like a detention center and was called the Island of Tears, where many died and thousands of sick children were separated from their families, and those who died were buried in pauper's graves. Does any of this sound familiar? Island of Tears, Lake of Tears, people being buried in pauper's graves. Also, what comes to mind when I think of Ellis Island is Battery Park and Liberty Island. Liberty Island is home to the Statue of Liberty, who, like Boyd, carries a torch. Also, a battery is where artillery is stored, like the battery Matthias was in when he got caught slipping by Reggie. Reggie then leaves the battery to go find Boyd and finds him after he gets the torch. The torch is also what Boyd uses to liberate Randall, Julie, and Marielle. There is also a Native American connection to this place as well. It's believed that Manhattan was sold to the Dutch settlers by the Lenape tribe of Manhattan. However, a letter by Peter Shagan is the only document to prove this claim. Moreover, the Lenape tribe had no concept of land ownership. So how can they sell something that they didn't have a concept of owning? Stolen land, maybe? Do these clues point to another reference to America's troubled history? Here's a fun fact about the immigrant children who came to Ellis Island. They were all given a mental acuity test. A wooden puzzle was given to them to solve and if they weren't able to solve the puzzle, they were labeled as feeble-minded and sent back home, or they just disappeared. Does any of that sound familiar? Yes, the puzzle that Tabitha and Victor saw in the cave that ended up in the storage room and given to Ethan by T and Chen. Speaking of the Lu family, I had a comment about my connection to the Civil War. The commenter asked about the Lu family, and if the connection to the Civil War is valid, then how would the Lu family fit into the equation being that no Chinese fought in the war? My answer to this is two part. First is that the connection to the Civil War may not be the only aspect of American history that tethers these bloodlines to this place. Second, there were Chinese who fought in the Civil War. Some fought for the Union and some fought for the Confederacy. In fact, the children of the first original Siamese twins fought for the Confederacy. Chang and Ang Bunker were Siamese-American conjoined twins whose fame propelled the expression Siamese twins, with them being from Siam. Chang means left and Ang means right, and they were both drafted into the war. However, being unable to participate, they sent their sons in their place. There are other Chinese who fought in the war as well. Moreover, Chinese-American workers were a crucial part of the construction of the American railroad system. Many Chinese would come to America and adopt names like Christopher, John, Paul, and Kenneth. Kenny's original name was Fu Han, but he wanted an American name, just like many of the Chinese who came to America in the past. With the clues being dropped about American history, clues about grandparents, bloodlines, and lineage, 
Native American sorcery, and all of our residents traveling in the continental United States ending up in this place. There's no doubt in my mind that the reason these people are being transported here is due to multiple events in American history that have drawn an ancestral link to our residents. Just a quick update on my novel. I'm still writing. I'm staying busy and positive. The pacing is great, but I still have a ways to go. And as I get close to the end, I will keep you posted. And the rollout will be full of artwork and context to get you prepared for the official release. The website for my YouTube channel is still under construction, but the novel will have its own landing page and I will keep you posted on both. I have some really dope merch ideas for the Real Enigmas and Theories page and we'll be updating you on that as well. One more thing about From before we go. Something has had me scratching my head since I noticed it. That's the train tracks that I spoke about in my last Train to Clarksville video. I spoke about the tracks appearing multiple times, and when Ethan walks into the diner, the song by the Monkees, entitled The Last Train to Clarksville, comes on. I want you guys to go check out that video and meet me in the comments section. Let me know if you've noticed anything about the train tracks or any dialogue that may have hinted something so we can figure this thing out together. Just a little something to think about while we wait on the next episode. That's all for my video today. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.